Cool. So I just want to give everybody sort of, um, is the mic? Can, mic? can you hear me? Not great. Can I? Okay. All right. I'll <laughs> <laughs> Our mic was not working earlier, so uh, maybe. So we're, okay. yeah. we're, yeah. so, we're working um, good. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so first I just want to give everybody sort of an idea about, um, about how I kind of want the, the discussion to go. So we're going to start out where what I'm going to do is just, um, in case you didn't have a chance to read the paper or you're confused about things, I'm going to sort of give a summary of the things I think that are the most interesting parts of the paper, um, just so that everybody can kind of be on the same page. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of time to, to talk about things that you want. But then we're going to try something new, where I have, I have pre-appointed some people to be discussion leaders. And if you feel like you um, want to be a discussion leader too, then you can just raise your hand at that point in time. And we'll break off into smaller groups to try to try maybe, um, you know, in some groups of like five to ten people, just um, talking about it, so that you can have you know a chance to to ask questions. But you know, maybe if you're nervous about talking in front of the whole group, you don't have to be nervous. It's only ten people, um, you know, whatever. So so we'll give that a shot. So. Um, so with that in mind, um, this paper is about Sparrow. Um, so Sparrow is a, um, the thing I think that really captures Sparrow best is, um, or at least the thing that they wrote to capture Sparrow best is that it's a decentralized, randomized sampling approach um, for scheduling that provides near optimal performance um, and, and scalability. Now, um, something that I kind of want to plant the seed of in your mind is that Although this paper talks about Sparrow in reference to things like, you know, compared to Hadoop or compared to Spark, um, I also think that Sparrow is really something that if you, um, we've all probably dealt with load balancers at some point, um, and that Sparrow really kind of looks like a load balancer if you sort of tilt your head a little bit. Um, and so I kind of want to just plant that seed while we start talking about some of the techniques that they use, um, because I think that that's, that's actually a really interesting, really interesting thing in this paper. So. Um, so, so what is Sparrow? Well, the idea is that, is that what we had was we have these frameworks like Hadoop. And what Hadoop does is it, is it improves this thing that we used to do before. I mean, this might be harder. So what we used to do was we had some computers. And what we would do is we have some problem. So like here's a problem. And we make our problem into some data. And then we would send that over to the computer. And that's what we did like, I don't know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Then Hadoop came out, and we changed this around. You guys have a left marker or an eraser? Oh, we can use the about. Yeah, yeah. So, what we did then was we change this so that instead of sending our compute to the data, we sent, or sorry, instead of sending the data to the compute, we would send our programs to the data. So now, but what does it mean to send a program? In this case, our program is some kind of binary application. Now, what was the win here? Well, our program, our problem data, it kept getting bigger and bigger. Maybe, you know, over here we got like 10 gigabytes of data. And our applications, even when our applications are really big, they're not that big. Maybe, I don't know, say 100 megabytes for a really big application. So it was more efficient to send our program over to the data. But Sparrow changes that again. And what we do in Sparrow is we send our data to the compute to the data. Um, and so what I mean by that is, so we have our, our problem. Okay, it's like you know, 10 gigs or whatever. In the Sparrow paper, they mention things like Yarn and Slurm and Mesos. And if you know what I'm talking about and you read the paper, then you're like, cool, this will make some, it'll make sense. If you didn't read it, it doesn't really matter. There's these things, they don't matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> what we, so what we do is we take these programs and we send them over to the data. But the problem still is this program is 100 megabytes. Now, uploading a 100 megabyte file takes like a second or two. But one of the motivations of Spark is what they want to do is they want to make it so that you can just log onto a website and get real-time interactive queries where you can, you know, maybe like you jump to your email and you don't just see your email, but it searches every email that everybody in your company has ever sent. Um, but not just your company, everything in some multinational conglomerate. And it doesn't just filter all those emails, but it also applies like privacy rules to them so you can't see secret stuff. So we want to do lots of computation. And the problem is that 
all those rules, they start to get pretty big to encode if we want to send over the application itself. So with Sparrow, what we're trying to do is we're saying, well, really, the data is just like the string email. And then what we're going to do is we're going to send the string over to the program, you know, which is bigger. And the program is hopefully we already sent it over to the data. And so what we end up doing is we end up sort of being able to send an even smaller amounts of data um, in transit, which helps us, um, it's one of the ways that we can improve performance. So that is sort of the design goal. So then, can I get this chair? I don't know if you have another chair. Oh, yeah. So, um, so basically, this is the idea. Now, I want to draw another parallel here. So, as everybody knows how HTTP works, or like making a web request, even if you didn't know those HTTP, that's that's over HTTP. So, really, in that case, we're doing just that. You in your HTTP request send your little request. That's the data. It goes over to a web server. That's some compute. And that web server lives in the data center near some databases. And that's your, your big problem data. So really, in some sense, what we're doing is Sparrow is taking inspiration from this, this um, web application architecture where our clients are sending requests to our servers, and our servers make up responses and send them back. Now, there's a few things, though, that Sparrow does differently. Um, differently than it is than a regular load balancer or than a regular sort of web app. And there's really, there's three things, I think, that are, that are most interesting. So those three things are, one second. So those three things are power of two scheduling, batch sampling, and empirical measurements. So let's go over each of these things in turn. So one thing I think that, um, that the Sparrow paper, it really it just doesn't go, it doesn't explain at all, is this power of two sampling. There's, there's a little bit about it, but it's a really interesting idea. And, um, and I think that it's also something that even without understanding much about statistics, it's something that we can all get. So, this is the one thing that if you get nothing else out of the paper, and if you get nothing else that I explain to you, this thing I want to make sure that everybody has some idea how it works. I do. Speak more into the mic. Can you guys not hear me in the back? Nope. The mic's off. Okay. Oh, that's right. That's off. Yeah. I'm just going to. Can you just hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. Okay, okay great. I'll just Ooh. talk like this. Wow. So, um, right. So, so what's the idea here? So normally, let's look at like, um, we have this thing called um, request latencies, right? What that means is sometimes when I make a request to some system, it takes 10 milliseconds, sometimes it takes 100 milliseconds. And what we can do is we can actually visualize that. So what we can do is we can make an axis where this axis is the latency. And generally, if we look at it, it looks something like this. So over here, these are low latencies. Over here, these are high latencies. Does this chart make sense to people? OK. So now. The goal is we want to do two things. One thing is, instead of it looking like this red chart, say red is bad, we want it to look more like this green chart, which is good. And what this means is we're not seeing you know, some really fast, some really slow. We're trying to sort of make them all be about the same speed. The other thing that we want to happen is we just want to shift this as far to the left as possible. So those are the two goals. And so power of two scheduling is how we're going to do that. So the idea here is, well, what if we could guess, and what if we knew in advance and we said, well, some machines we know they're over here on the right side, and some machines we know they're over here on the left side. All right, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, if we always pick machines on the left side, then we're always gonna be doing better than the middle. 
Now that doesn't exactly make sense because if you're always doing better than the middle, well, that doesn't where you know the middle moves as you continue to beat it. So at some point you can't do better and you just get to as best as it can be. Um, and so that's this power of two scheduling idea. So let's see what that looks like. So the idea is what happens if we pick random servers? Well, random servers, you know, we could be anywhere here, and that's that's what this chart represents. But if we do power of two, what we're going to get is this a little chart, a little um, square. So this side is one request, and this side is the other request. Because remember, we're checking two servers to see which one is going to actually serve up our request. Now, each of these servers, there's two types here. There could be there's going to be two fast servers, and there's going to be two slow servers. So each of these squares happens with 25% of the time. You know, 25% of the time, this request is going to get a server that is faster than half of the others. 25, or sorry, 50% of the time, this request is faster than half. 25% of the time, this one is fast, is slower than half. So what does this mean when we look at this chart? Well. It means that in three out of the four cases, we actually end up with a faster request than the median. In only one of the four cases, we end up with a slower request. So this is some, this, um, I think this is a, a nicer sort of intuitive model for why the power of two scheduler does so much better. Now, we can actually see how much better it does by a chart that they have. Find that chart. <coughs> so if you have the paper, it's on page four. If you don't have the paper, I'm just going to sketch it really quick. So I've tried to color match the chart um, in the paper. So what we have here is we have four little things where this axis is the response time in milliseconds. And this other axis is um, the load. The load, that sort of represents the difficulty factor. So um, you know, generally, obviously, if you, only, if you only ever get one request at a time to your system, it's always going to do great. You know, Things get harder when there's more things going on. So. Um, basically, but I would consider this sort of the, the difficulty of the problem we're trying to solve. So what we see is that in the red case, that's where we just pick a random server. And we can see that you know, as requests increase, the latency increases. Now with the blue one though, that's where we start adding that red, this um, power of two sampling. And you can see that actually for a while it does pretty well and it only starts to, to perform poorly the further we go on. Now the green one, what the green one does is something called batch sampling, which is the second point in this paper that I think is pretty interesting. So um, before I go into batch sampling, though, I want to find, I want to ask, does anybody have any questions about the power of two stuff or sort of the motivating factors of this paper? It's not clear why they call it power of two. Uh, they call it power of two because... I think it's originally power of two choices. Power of two choices? Okay. It's not power, like you gain power by having no. two choices. Uh, uh, the origin of power of two choices was popular, popularized by Michael Wissenmacher uh, in some of his early, in some of his work after grad school, where basically it's for ge ge a generalized probabilistic model of load balancing, you actually have a much tighter bound on the expected uh, max load of any bin in a, you're randomly allocating balls to bins if you pick the min of two random choices. Um, if you want to learn about the power of two choices, you should read the papers by Michael Mitzenmacher. They're very good. Right, so that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, Another way to think about it, or the way that I like to think about it, um, and this is something that as we sort of go through batch sampling the LC, is that in this case, essentially what we're doing is um, we're picking, when we say we pick two servers, you see 75% of the time we do better. But what if we instead, for each one of these, we chose four servers? Well, then we'd have this like 16 element matrix. And if you go through the 16 element matrix and see how often 
Say instead you look at the, at the fastest quarter server now, and then you look at the 16 element matrix, and you'll see that actually, you know, more of a bigger chunk of the 16 element matrix will be in this, we're doing better than the median camp. So, you know, it's also there in that it's, um, you know, you can, it, the power is a knob that you can turn. Um, and that's, we'll see how you can turn that with batch sampling better. Yeah. This assumes all the servers are equal in their ability to serve. It does. Um, now, the last thing that we look at, the empirical measurement, that is going to um, compensate for the fact that, um, that our idealized model of all servers are equal um, isn't true. And instead, we're going to say, how are servers doing right at this moment? And we're going to schedule based on that information instead. Cool. So batch sampling. Batch sampling is another thing that I think is um, it's really cool. Trying to figure out how to get the ink off the board. <laughs> so for batch sampling, um, the paper I think has a really great example. So I'm just going to just going to reiterate the paper's example for why batch sampling works. Um, so let's look at two example probes. Now there's two types of servers. We're going to call them fast servers and slow servers. Okay. So we have request one, and request one, it's going to get two slow servers. And then we also have request two, and request two is going to get two fast servers. So what this means now is that request one, its response time is going to be slower than the median, but request two, its response time is going to be faster than the median. What batch sampling says is it says, hey, why don't we just do this all as a batch? So we'll probe four servers for both requests simultaneously, and then we'll take the best servers out of all of those probes, and we'll use those together. And when we do this, then we see that actually both requests will get a fast server, where had we probed them separately, they would not have both got fast servers. And this just generalizes. So the higher the throughput that you get, the more um, probes that you can do simultaneously, and then the the more, the more there exists different sort of shuffling where, oh, you know, this one, this one had a really good luck probe and this one had a really bad luck probe, so we'll just kind of share that information among them so we get a better result overall. So that's this batch sampling idea. Um, and this is something also that, you know, I mean, I think, I, I really want to, the thing that I like about this paper so much is that they're taking these ideas that are really popular in like, um, in web architectures and in improving performance of databases and improving performance really of everything. And they're just applying it to this different domain. So, you know, we saw this power of two scheduling, which came from load balancing. Now we're seeing this batch sampling, which is really, we're just saying, let's just batch all the requests and try to, you know, get some better work done here. Um, this is something where if you ever used MongoDB even, you know, by, I don't know if they still do this by default, but for a while there was a lot of people <laughs> did not like MongoDB because it would try to bash up the writes as it made them. What that meant was that if you killed MongoDB at the wrong time, you'd lose all the writes in the batch that hadn't been written yet. But, you know, this is, this is a trick that, um, that's pretty popular to use. Um, and it's something that you can take away and sort of see that, you know, works in really small things that don't work well, works in really big systems that are fast. Um, so that's batch sampling. Does anybody have any questions about batch sampling? Yeah. When the requests are hitting the server, how are they deciding like which one is best? Do they have to go back and tell where they were sent from, or how does that decision right. make? So, so what happens is, so let me draw another chart to explain this. So what we do is we have these, um, I'll move out of the way in a second. We have these things, these sparrows, okay? And then we have some workers. And each of the workers has a queue. So what happens is a user connects to one of the Sparrow schedulers. And then the Sparrow scheduler randomly picks some workers. In this case, we're doing the power of two picking, right? And so what it does is it's going to connect to pick those workers that it picked and say, hey, workers. How many elements are in your queue? And we're going to say the number of elements in a worker's queue represents how fast that worker is. 
because sort of intuitively, you know, the more work it has, the longer the queue, the longer it's going to take for it to answer. And you know, conversely, you know, the shorter the queue, the faster it's going to answer. So, does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Cool. Did you have a question? Um, so, I just want to make sure that request one and request two are two different requests that the same person is making, and instead of sending off each request independently, we are sending them together, and you're sending it to all four servers instead of each request individually sending it to two servers. Right. So, so the idea is that these, these requests these requests are coming into the Sparrow schedulers. Okay, now the Sparrow schedulers, though, they need to make these probes, which I represented by these arrows. Okay. Um, and so these are the probe results. So what we're saying is, well, if one Sparrow scheduler has, if for each request it probes them independently and does not share information between those probes, then it's not going to do as well as if instead every 50 milliseconds it batches up all of the probes, all of the requests that it's gotten, does all of those probes simultaneously, and then looks at the best results of those. Okay, um, double checking on that. Yeah, right, it's basically the idea is that by, when you treat them all independently, you're going, you're, you get this, you know, you get the one result, which is sort of the, the power of two improvement, but when you do the batch result, you have these other cases like where, you know, where one of them is especially bad, or one of them is especially good, and then that additional shared information results in it, gives you a better result. Uh, or in the back? Uh, is there an optimal size of the, the batch size? Like, you, I mean, it wouldn't make sense for you to have, like, wait until the batch is the size of, like, all your workers, right? Right. So, so the idea with the batching is really, it's, it ends up being, um, being um, sort of a, a latency performance trade-off, where the longer you wait, the bigger your batch. The bigger the batch, the better the results. But the whole point of batching is to reduce latency. So you don't want to wait too long, because then you're defeating the purpose of the operation. So, um, so generally, I mean, when it comes to batching, the paper actually explains two different batching techniques. One of them is that, well, so first of all, remember, Sparrow is really targeted at these MapReduce computations. So when you're doing a MapReduce job, the, the thing that comes into Sparrow results in Sparrow knowing it needs to execute 1,000 tasks, say, which means it can just immediately make 2,000 probes with zero, that doesn't wait at all, it just knows instantly that's what it needs to do. There is, um, it goes into more detail about, um, about placement constraints, and there's some problems with this, this type of batching with placement constraints. And for that, from the, for that, based on my reading of the paper, it seems like it waits like every 10 milliseconds, it takes everything that's happened over that 10 millisecond period and batches that together. Is there a question over here? Yeah. yeah. So each of those Sparrow nodes is making a couple of requests but they're separate, uh, you know, they're, they're separate machines. Uh, so there's added overhead then and for them to coordinate their results to find the best results for each, you know, for, across the batch as opposed to each uh, individual Sparrow node's answer. So that's actually, it's a great question. So the idea with Sparrow is that um, an individual Sparrow node coordinates an individual user intention. So if a user intends for something that results in a thousand tasks getting executed, then that one Sparrow node is going to manage all of those tasks. Um, if the, now, the, the, one of the powerful features of Sparrow is that it's, um, it's a share nothing architecture. You know, this is something that most web applications try to do this. They try to move all their state into the database. And in this case, our database is the queues on the workers. So instead of these um, Sparrow nodes needing to communicate between each other to coordinate something or to load balance you know, and to somehow you know, meet their goals by communicating, instead they communicate when they talk to a worker and discover how long the queue is on that worker. That the, the queue length is sort of the, is the data storage for the information of interest to Sparrow. And that changes when the death one? The batching, so the batching is done inside of the Sparrow node. Um, the, queue, the workers are really dumb. The only thing a worker can do is say um, it can execute a task or it can accept a task to be enqueued and give you a response later and it can also tell you how much is in the queue. That's all, that's all the workers need to do for now. There's, they'll, they'll do something new in a few minutes. <laughs> Any more on batching? Cool. So now the next thing, um, the kind of the last thing that I think is really important in the Sparrow paper um, is this idea of empirical measurement. Um, and I believe they call this late finding. So 
And, and, late, and it is, and they call, not only do they call it late binding, but it really is late binding. It's late binding in the sense of, um, you know, closure has some late binding features, some other, um, I think Erlang has some late binding features in it. Um, there's a lot of languages that have a, a lot of things and they all call them late binding, and they are all late binding. Sparrow is another instance of this sort of pattern. So, um, so there's a problem with everything that I said here. Um, it's a really big problem, and it turns out in practice um, that when you look at it, these ideas are good, but they're not great. They don't really, they don't really make Sparrow into an awesome scheduler. They make it into a, mar into a substantial improvement over the state of the art, but not like, not like killer. And so this late binding thing, that's what makes Sparrow um, killer. So what's the idea here? Well, these Sparrow nodes, and the way that it decides fast or slow, that's all based on queue length, right? We look at some things and we say, oh, this queue is you know, 10 elements long, this one's three elements long. The three element long one must be faster than the 10 element long one. Um, but then that might not be true. What if the 10 element queues jobs all take 10 milliseconds and the three element queues jobs each take 1,000 milliseconds? Then the 10 element queue is um, six times faster. So it would be a really bad idea if, um, if we went on queued up alone. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to measure and we're going to see which queue is actually faster. Um, now, at this point, you might be saying, okay, but that's pretty weird because what you're saying, you're saying, you ask a question now about a thing that's going to happen in the future. Because right now, I want to find out whenever they're done, who was finished first, or who will be finished first. But we're asking that without having any information about what was happening. So how do we do that? Um, the way we do it, is that we're going to take this communication model and make it a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to make another diagram for that. So we have our Sparrow node here. And we have our worker over here. Now there's going to be a, a, a four-way a four handshake that these two are going to do. The first thing Sparrow is going to do is it's going to say reservation. Uh, it means make me a reservation on this worker. And so at this point, what the worker does is it puts a little thing into a queue saying, all right, I got you. You're right here. You're like fifth in line now. And so when Sparrow does a probe, the probes, they don't, they don't actually measure the queue depth anymore. Now our probe is like, it's like making a little ticket, like when you go to the deli counter or the bakery counter and you take one of those tickets, that's what we're gonna do now. And so what happens is at some point, the worker's gonna say, um, you know, great, uh, it's your turn. Are, are you still interested in this? Because I mean, I'm sure we've all went to the deli or you know, any of those things, the ticket things, and um, got really pissed off that it took so long and just stormed out, kept our ticket. It's like, nobody else can have this ticket. I waited all that time to get any food, <laughs> so they can't either. Um, and that's okay, you know, that happens in Sparrow too. Um, so, so, you know, so the deli worker um, is going to say to the Sparrow, say, hey, like, do you want to run your job now? Because it's your turn if you're interested. Um, at that point, the worker can say, yeah, sure. Um, here's my job. And we're going to pass that job on over. And at this point now, um, the, the worker actually is going to run the job for real. And then finally, in the final stage, we're going to send the results back. Now, what this does compared to the, um, the, the Q depth probe is that what we're doing is by putting in the reservation, the, the, the time that we get the first OK, that is the fastest one of whichever ones we probed. You know, we don't care which ones we probed, but when we get that OK back, we know that one is ready because actually the node is idle, it's not actually computing anything when it says okay. And then when we run the job, it gets immediately run with zero latency. Now, you might say, well, this is great, you know, we've just, we've eliminated all the uncertainties due to queue depths being a poor approximation of the actual queue um, amount of work that's pending on that node. Uh, what's the penalty? Well, the penalty here is, um, is in this little region, and I'm scribbling in red. See, between the time that the worker says OK and the job gets back to the worker, the worker can't do anything because it's waiting for somebody to tell it what to do next. So 
What ends up happening here is that this late binding thing, it's more effective um, as the network latencies become short or the job lanes become long. So longer jobs and faster networks, this is a good idea. If your jobs and your networks are equal length, then this reservation idea doesn't work because you end up sitting idle for an entire job's worth of work and your throughput just goes through the floor or hits the floor and then sort of stays there. Um, now, there is another, um, there's another really interesting thing in this paper. Or actually, so, all right. So this is this empirical measurement thing. Um, does anybody have any questions about this empirical measurement? Yeah. Doesn't this then also uh, mean basically a cue on the sparrow worker too of like the jobs that are waiting to be done as opposed to the queues waiting on the workers? Like you've moved the queue basically at this point. So there was, there was always um, sort of the set of pending tasks on the sparrow worker because it needs to know what's still outstanding, yeah. right? Um, I, I would call it less of a queue. Well, Okay, yeah, there is a queue also on the sparrow worker. So the sparrow worker knows what needs to be done. It makes all the reservations in a big batch. And then as it gets OKs, it starts shifting its queue from here to here. So yeah, we did we shuffled the queues around a little bit. I'm just thinking of reliability. Like if, like if you lose a worker, you lose four jobs in the batch handling. But if you lose a, if you lose a sparrow node, then you've lost a lot more jobs in this, in this setup. So actually, um, Am I wrong? so you are, but not for the reason you think. Ah. Um, so in both cases, you lose all the jobs. The, um, the idea with Sparrow is that the scheduler is stateless. The idea is that there's some client saying, I want you to run this job. And if the Sparrow node dies before the client gets its result, it just submits it to a different Sparrow. Okay. So that, that's, that's sort of the underlying assumption throughout the paper. So yeah, so you don't, you don't lose anything more. If you try to shift the persistence over here, um, then actually you're starting to move away from the shared nothing architecture. And there's all kinds of new um, distributed problems you get to deal with. Right. Yeah. Um, so the client, the final source of truth, is like what needs to be done still. Exactly. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. does this Sparrow only uh, reserve the task on one worker or multiple workers? So these reservations, these are replacing those those probes, either those power of two probes or the batch probes. So what happens is Sparrow gets you know <coughs> gets some job. That job is a thousand tasks then the Sparrow node, now that it has those 1,000 tasks, it's going to make 2,000 reservations. The first 1,000 reservations that it gets an OK for, those are going to run the jobs. The second 1,000, um, just, we're just going to ignore them because we're not interested anymore. Yeah? I think they actually oh, sure. um, oh, sure. oh, yes. Was there some consideration in the paper, I don't know, I didn't, sorry, I didn't read it, to, to uh, you know, say, well, why do a reservation? Why don't you just send the job? But then when the worker's ready, it says, hey, I'm actually running it. Mm -hmm. And that could be sort of the protocol. Was that? So I don't think that they talked about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, yeah, I think that that, that would definitely um, improve um, for certain types of workloads. Um, you know, if we go back to that idea about like how much data are we transmitting, you know, it may be that a job is a little bit bigger. Um, or I think generally the idea is that a probe is like on the order of bytes, you know. A job is kilobytes, um, so you know it's a, it's a thousand x more um, communication um, throughput is required to send the job as part of the reservation. But for certain workloads, you could definitely do that. Um, I think it was. Okay, so yeah. <clears throat> if the worker is just coming back to the Sparrow scheduler every time that it needs a new job, and you're sending the job at the time that it requests it, how is this particularly different than just a FIFO queue on the Sparrow side and a producer-consumer problem, like a classic producer-consumer scheduler? Doesn't it just kind of eliminate the entire batch sample empirical measurement model? Like, so so you mean with the idea about why does the worker call back? So like the Sparrow makes a call out to multiple workers and it's effectively saying I can queue all of you for the next thing that I have to run, and yeah. then the workers all come back and say like I have a thing, like I have a slot to run on, yeah. and the Sparrow scheduler just hands back to him. How is this different than just just that step? Like how does power of two batch sample and even the statement of, like, this is late binding, but how, how do the, does everything else factor in that makes it fundamentally different from just the workers requesting work? Ah, uh, yes, so I think that, so, so basically, um, I'm gonna try to summarize it into like a one phrase and see if you agree. Um, so what you're saying is like, um, if we just had one big shared queue that all the workers are reading from, how is this different than that? To, well, I mean, you're sharding across sparrows, but right. other but than even that. Each sparrow, like, why is each sparrow not just one big shared queue? 
Right. So, um, so the thing, so if each sparrow was one big shared queue, then that means that each worker needs to know about every sparrow. I mean, does it? Because it effectively, uh, it has been like you're you're setting up a queue of reservations across sparrows. You're you're saying like, right. I go back to this sparrow this time and this sparrow this time. You could easily flip it around and say this worker approaches random sparrows whenever it has work re ready. Um, like, so that's a great point. Um, and so, you you may have heard of something called work stealing. Um, and yeah, there's there is really there's a really interesting. Um, um, going back to the first papers we love, I missed the second one, so I don't know if the duality came up there too. But there, yeah, there is sort of a duality between this sparrow model and work stealing. Where in work stealing, um, our workers are pulling data, and here we are pushing workers to pull data. Um, so maybe, maybe it's a duality, maybe it's really just um, sort of a subset relation. But yeah, there is, those are very similar ideas. Um, yeah. yeah. My question was just, um, if the worker says, okay, I'm ready, and the sparrow is no longer interested, does it actively have to send a message to say I'm not interested, or does the worker just time out? Ah, uh, I'll get back to that. <laughs> yeah, how about prioritizing the jobs, prioritizing the jobs? I'll also get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes? So you have uh, two sparrow nodes, and um, they all probe a uh, random sample of, of the workers, but if, you, if you're a client and you want to run something on some workers, just because you ask that one Spyro node uh, to run your job, it doesn't mean that his workers, the workers that he probed, are going to have free slots. Like you might, if you had pinged a different Spyro, then you might have had a free slot faster than and if you waited for, for that one, one node. And, and so I'm not, I'm not really sure how they deal with that. And also, how they deal with like over capacity. So, one worker goes back to you and says, I have one slot, but you need 10 to run. Right. How do we deal with that? So, um, all right, so let me answer the second one first. So, um, each job, the, the idea with Sparrow is, um, or actually I'll answer both, both of those at the same time. Um, the idea with Sparrow is that we're using, um, we're using randomized algorithms um, instead of trying to get, um, instead of trying to come up with a solution that solves the actual optimal problem, we're going to use a randomized algorithm that approaches the optimal solution. And the reason that we use the randomized algorithm that approaches the optimal solution, rather than doing everything, is that you can get much higher scheduling throughput. Um, some of the examples they gave was, so they talk about some, um, a system called Spark. Um, Spark is the sort of in-memory map reduce that's become um, very popular for like analytics stuff because you can get an answer to your, you know, a Hadoop job that took 10 minutes on Spark, it takes maybe one or two seconds. Um, and so Sparrow it was designed by the same lab that Spark came out of, and they're like, okay, well, what do we do for the next step? What if Spark wasn't just for research or for like analytics people, but it was actually for every single request was a Spark job? Um, and so the idea there is, well, if you just look at the number of scheduling decisions you need to make per second, each note, you would need to make millions to hundreds of millions of scheduling decisions per second. And if you consider like, you know, a really beefy server, like, you know, how, what big of a server do you have for like 10 grand? You maybe like 40 or 50 CPUs, a couple hundred gigs of RAM. Like you think this is really fast, but that machine is going to get to make you know 10,000 um, decisions per second, maybe 100,000 scheduling decisions per second. Um, and so, in order to achieve that level of scalability, where you can actually solve you know an infinite number of these per second, I mean by continuing to throw more machines, and also with the caveat that at some point nothing works. Um, <laughs> but you know, to do a lot better, um, you need to start splitting the stuff between the multiple sparrows. You need to trust that the randomized algorithm um, in expectation works well. And, um, and generally, and with, and basically the idea is randomized stuff, it works pretty well. The power of two thing really helps control the tail latencies. The late binding helps deal with the fact that we can't estimate um, Q depths accurately. And so, you know, when you look at it in practice, it actually works really well. Now, coming back to the capacity problem, um, so that is, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, so you know, what happens if you have, if your cluster can serve you know, a billion requests and you get a billion and a half requests? Like what do you do? Um, well you fall over. Um, that's the only answer to that question. Um, and, that's, and that's something you, know, you see this in um, most companies that start getting really big data centers with like hundreds to you know, thousands to tens of thousands of machines. Um, what they do is they do capacity planning and they ensure that they have more capacity available for serving than they do for the requests. 
And, um, and when they do start hitting that capacity limit, they start rejecting requests. And yep. you can see even in the, in the um, Sparrow paper that when they hit around 80 to 90 percent load, um, the algorithm starts doing very poorly. But, I mean, that still doesn't solve the problem when you can actually serve the load. So let's say that this power node, like it needs to serve like, 10 tasks, right, 10 slots, uh, but it only asks four servers. So uh, and, and the total like cluster capacity is 100. So you could serve the, the request. You just couldn't serve it because you hit that very specific spiral of randomization. And, so, like, and then you can't hit over 50% because then your, your latency of your scheduler essentially goes up, right? Like so in, in randomized algorithms, bad luck doesn't really happen. Yeah. That's just, you, you just have to accept that bad luck isn't a problem. Um, and like, um, what, it, what it really comes down to is the idea is that what is bad luck? It's like it's, you're flipping a coin and every time you flip you get tails. And so you know, to do what you're saying, you'd have to flip you know, thousands of coins and get a streak of tail, like thousands of tails in a row. And, um, and what you can do, and I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna hand wave through this, so what you can do is actually, um, you can calculate, like based on the rate of requests and the, um, the odds of you, of you getting it wrong, is that actually the universe, or the, the Earth is going to get swallowed by the sun before it doesn't, um, probably before you like get bad luck. Um, that works. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, we, I, if you want to, um, like, in, you know, when we're like in small groups, I can like actually um, prove that, but, um, <laughs> but I have to, yeah, it's not super, the proof is not interesting. Well, not super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Sparrow machine is a CPU bone or IO bone? <sighs> um, the Sparrow <coughs> machines? Yeah. I would guess they're metal bones. Oh man, that's a great question, actually. I don't know if they're CPU or IO bound. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, both the CPU and the I.O. problems they have are pretty small. I would guess I.O. bound because the CPU problem they have is like so freaking trivial that I would be like shocked if this saturated a core to like, you know, I mean, because you're just saying choose like 10,000 out of, you know, 100,000. Like that, I would guess that it's the network um, card is what saturates first. So yeah. it will not be too much writing into hard disk, or it will be doing. Uh, there's no no disk activity, in it. I'm not even. Exp there is no hard disk in these things. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Cool. So I'm going to get back now to your question about what happens if you don't want it. Okay. So there's two possible things you could do. One of them is you get this okay, and you send them a job, but it's a special job that says I don't care, and then <laughs> you get your special result back saying like yeah, me neither. Um, so, you know, what if we do that? Well, if you send this, I don't care, and then you get this result back, me neither, then you're actually going to pay a big, you're paying like a pretty big latency cost, because now you're not just paying this little thing between the okay and the job yes. getting back, you're paying another, um, you know, idle time, which is the time that it takes to actually receive this, you know, and decide you don't care, and then send back the I don't care. So, the other thing that you can do is, is um, something called proactive cancellation. Um, and what this means is that instead of saying, um, is that what you say is you say, you know, actually, hey, like, I'm not going to be here anymore. So when you're done, you have sort of, you know, some other, I don't know, out of band communication mechanism saying, like, never mind. Oh, this is awful. You can't read this. Um, yeah. So you have this never mind RPC that um, lets you just say, like, yeah, whatever. So there's an interesting thing about like what is the right which is which is better is this better or is this better, and they have a they have an interesting discussion of this. So it turns so remember I just want to kind of remind everyone um, the reason we're doing this is because the network latency, the network's um, latency is much faster than the time it takes to solve a problem. So because that's true, this little exchange about the the I don't the the like you know I don't care messages that should be really cheap. Proactive cancellation helps as the network becomes slower or the jobs become faster. So, you know, we're going in the direction that makes this less useful. Proactive cancellation helps to mitigate the penalty of those I don't care, um, those no op jobs. So, it, it really depends on the exact workload you're running, which is the one you want. Yeah? So, what's the additional cost of that? It doesn't seem like much because you still have to send the I don't care back. For the, pro the, for the proactive cancellation? So the idea is that um, you might still be in the middle of the queue, right? Okay. 
So now this machine still has a set idle for this period, but you get to skip this idle period. Right. Yeah. So that's all you're doing. But like, so if your if your network takes ten milliseconds to make a network call, and your jobs take fifteen milliseconds, you just save like twenty percent. Right. Well, so it basically, it sounds like you're moving the idle care message earlier in time. Right? Exactly. So what is there an additional cost to that? Um, Cause it seems like you just may as well just do it. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think that they actually have a reason maybe that it doesn't work. Um, yeah, no, I don't think it really, yeah, I think it's probably just, probably better just to always proactively cancel. Um, there is code complexity there, though, that for some problems just doesn't matter. Yeah. Is there an assumption that forwarding this to a friend would be negligibly faster than just flipping to the next res reservation in the work queue? So, um, so like, uh, the Sparrow node has just gotten an, a, a handle for a worker that can do something. Why, if it, it doesn't care, why doesn't it just hand it over to one of its neighbors and that neighbor process it as opposed to saying, I don't care, and then the, that time existing, and then the worker having to contact someone else. You eliminate one of those calls by just contacting a so peer. There's a damning sentence in this paper that talks about that where they say, we don't need to implement complex bug-ridden gossip protocols. Uh, the bug-ridden part I just added, but com they call it complex. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I think that, and this also really goes back to the cancellation thing, is that um, you know, when you're designing um, uh, these high-scale distributed systems, um, performance is really, is in many cases not, it's, it might be the first goal, but it's, it's very close second or maybe even tied with um, ease of implementation. Like, you know, when you're building these like crazy complex things, the last thing you want to do is make it so that you're the only person on the planet who understands it. You want to make it so that, you know, anybody can pick up a paper and be like, okay, yeah, I, I sort of see where you're going there. Like, you know, yeah, there's no gossip handshaking, you know, no like crazy timeout systems. Um, so, I mean, I think that it's really, a lot of it, a lot of what Sparrow's design comes down to is like, how do we strip away everything, you know, to result in this like really simple to implement thing. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> So, um, any other questions about these things? So will the people that I elected to be group leaders or people who want to be group leaders now raise their hands? Yeah. All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> so so we, got five, we got six group leaders, okay? So, um, so if you just, if, you had, if each group leader can walk away from each other <laughs> and then the people can walk towards group leaders, um, then, you know, I want to try to make it for like 10 minutes. We'll just sort of talk in a smaller group about it. Cool. So, um, all right. So hopefully everyone had a chance to discuss some stuff. Um, you know, I definitely heard some interesting things. So like, you know, if you guys have things came up in your group and you want to share them, um, I'll go first. Um, so one thing I learned was that actually um, that as an example of other places where this kind of randomized sampling is used to improve scheduling, Actually, like um, Oracle and SQL Server use them um, as part of their query planners. So they use that sort of, they sample the tables, and they see are they sparse or dense, they decide what types of joins to use in real time. So you know, that's just an example of the randomized, um, randomized sampling being applied in some other you know, scheduling problems. I don't know, if, that, do other people have things they wanted to, uh, thought were interesting that came up, or? Yeah? I have a question that we didn't totally answer my group, and that was, I was just kind of wondering, like, what, on what scale is this useful? How many worker servers do you need to have before it pays off to do this? Sure. So, um, so in the paper, what they talk about is they talk about that they, they made Sparrow because they couldn't, they wanted to answer so many requests that, that a single server couldn't schedule them. And so they had something where it's like thousands of workers and, you know, hundreds or thousands of requests per second. Um, so, at Two Sigma, we're hiring on my team. Um, we do a lot of cool stuff with distributed systems. Um, one of the things is we have um, we have a scheduling problem. We're using we're, we actually have two scheduling problems where we're using Sparrow. And I'll briefly remark on one of them without divulging too many secrets. Um, so the the problem that we have um, is similar in that we have workers. We have problems that are small code, which is big, but we want to pre-distribute. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take. Um, in our case, where one of the ways that we, but we have, you know, like, I don't know, 100 worker nodes, and maybe, um, we should like 100 worker nodes and maybe 10,000 clients. It's a little, very different distribution. Um, and for us, the reason that we're interested in this is that it allows us to avoid having central queues. 
So instead, instead of building a central queuing system, we are sort of just smearing the queues across the rest of the um, cluster, which means that we don't need to worry about any of the um, operational overheads of doing that. And we still get um, sort of um, optimal and expectation schedules coming out of it. So you know, I think that depending on the types of problems that you have, you can, you can leverage these same techniques on really small clusters and still see benefits. Um, especially if the problem that you have doesn't fit. It. Or, like, if our problem, we could solve it with Hadoop, we probably would not have done Sparrow. But given that our problem was really weird um, and it needed something custom, um, Sparrow was the easiest custom algorithm to implement um, with a lot of nice properties. So you're implementing the queues on your worker just in memory or, or using some queues? So no queuing system, it's all just in memory with your own code. Right? I'm not going to say. <laughs> Red active. Other uh, <laughs> questions, comments, interesting things that came up? Do we have prioritization, which I was asking you? Yes, so, right. Um, yeah, so, there, so speaking of prioritization, um, essentially the way that prioritization works is in these models, I sort of said each worker has one queue. What we can do instead is give each worker a bunch of queues. And then the worker itself can decide which queue it's going to be reading off of. So maybe the worker has three queues, like low, medium, and high priority. It always deals with high priority requests before the medium, before the low. And then now you have priority. Or maybe instead you want to do fair sharing. So then each user gets their own queue, and the worker just does like round robin off of those queues. Or, um, or there's, there's um, more sophisticated um, weighted fair sharing on multiple queues problems. So yeah, you, know, you can get both of those. Um, um, and so really, that turns out to be sort of the only type of, of prioritization scheme that you can do with Sparrow is something that you can represent with a set of queues and some kind of global decision. What it turns out though is that when you run this in practice, this actually works really well. And you can see that they get um, a near perfect um, uh, weighted fair sharing as they dynamically adjust um, the two, two users on a cluster. And you sort of see that. There's some diagrams in the paper that show that. On the prioritization front though, um, it's not quite as bright. Um, it turns out that because you can't cancel a task when it starts running, at least in the algorithm presented in the paper, um, what that means is that if a low priority task starts running and it takes hundreds of milliseconds, and say like three milliseconds after it starts, um, a high priority task comes in, it has to sit in line behind that low priority task. You can't like kill it and cause, you know, shuffle the order. So, I mean, that doesn't seem like a tough thing to add to Sparrow, and you know, if you did, then you would, you would probably be able to, to really um, get better prioritization um, and less kind of slop as you increase load. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yes? Other than yours, are there what good examples of Sparrow in the wild do you know of? So Spark, Spark is, Sparrow was written for Spark. Okay. Um, so Spark is this like in-memory MapReduce Hadoopy sort of thing, and they wrote Sparrow for Spark. Um, that's, that's what this paper is all about, the Spark Sparrow. Um, I know, yeah, the, I, my implementation is the only other one that I know of. Um, although, you know, I would highly recommend it. Like, if you know Go, Clojure, Erlang, Scala, like all these languages, basically any language that has the primitive where here's a few channels, tell me which one gave me the answer first. If your language has that, you can probably implement this in a day. Um, or you can implement parts of this in a day. The batch stuff is kind of tricky, the empirical stuff's really easy, you can, um, the queuing stuff is medium. And it's kind of cool because like, based on the problem you're interested in or like what part appeals to you, you can just sort of choose like, yeah, you know, I think I'm gonna do a power of two sampling with um, prioritization, but I'm not, I don't really care about batching. I don't care about the empirical stuff. Um, or maybe uh, you know, I only want to do empirical stuff with power of two and I'm not gonna worry about cues or, you know, so it's kind of flexible in that sense. Yeah. So yeah, actually this paper is a number of different techniques that all together is like minimize like, response times, like clients, like workers. And what I wanted to ask is like, so maybe something in the wild would be cool, but also like some additions, like mm -hmm. paper point system, that'd be really cool to just like tweak and play with it. Yeah, definitely. If there are any. Um, so I, there was, it goes, there's some stuff in here, um, particularly at the Paper end. Yeah, there, there's a, specifically there's a thank you to, um, where was it? Um, it was, Samir Agarwal actually um, helped to run the simulations. So um, I believe he's at MIT. Um, and you know, or, I mean, generally anybody in academia, it's really easy to find their email address because it's all over their papers. <laughs> so you can find him or any of the papers authors. And 
like 70% chance they'll give you their simulation, 30% chance they're saving it for their next publication. Um, <laughs> but you know, yeah, they're, I mean, they, they, don't, they had a simulator. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you know, you should, you should probe them all, see who responds first. You know, go from there. <laughs> so, um, but they, they definitely have a simulator because they're, they're, they have synthetic results for like 100,000 machine clusters. Um, they only tested it in practice in like 1,000 bit clusters. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. So I would just say anybody who's interested in real world load, load balancing stuff and hasn't already read it should Google Heroku Rap Genius and read about uh, that story. It was sort of a well documented snafu. Yeah. So the, the Heroku Rap Genius thing, once you read about that, what you should think to yourself is Power of Two scheduling would have solved all their problems. <laughs> <laughs> so. Huh? Or like three dedicated servers for all the crazy amount of money you spend. Yeah, I mean, or just I don't know. There's, I mean, there's, there's lots of power. I'm gonna go with power to scheduling with some of the problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Any other comments? Cool. Well, thanks all for coming. Uh,